Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I have Ratul with me. Ratul is a final year undergraduate at Bit Mesa. He has a highest rating of 1645 on code courses. And he recently got an internship plus FTE offer at media.net. So as we know, media.net is very, very famous for asking those very, very difficult competitive programming problems, right? Uh, so in this entire podcast, we'll be going through Ratul's journey and we'll be seeing how he learned programming, how he learned competitive programming and how he eventually backed this offer at media.net. Right. Uh, let me also tell you that Ratul is uh, Ratul was a part of TLE Eliminator's sixth batch in December 2022. And uh, in this video, we are not just going to talk about his overall journey, but also a part uh, where he was a part of TLE Eliminator's. Right. So some of the students from TLE Eliminator's who might be watching this video, uh, it might be really insightful for you to completely watch this podcast. Right. So welcome to the podcast, uh, Ratul. How are you? Hi, Priyansh. I'm fine. <clears throat> Thanks for the good intro. <laughs> Sure. Let's get started by first of all talking about, you know, uh, how did you get started with programming? Also, you're comfortable to talk in Hindi, English, whatever. Yes, works. both. Okay. So like before, after my JE counseling, I started programming, uh, learning programming a little bit. I, I jumped from a lot of things. Like first I started learning Java and uh, like I did DSA. I bought a Coding Ninjas course uh, for DSA in Java. And I was learning uh, DSA uh, using that. Then after that, uh, I was not aware about competitive programming at all during my first year. Then I heard my uh, batchmates talking about a code chef long contest. So I thought uh, I've been learning DSA and programming, so I should give it a chance. And when I solved uh, the problems, I tried the problems and I was just able to solve one problem. And that was also like too difficult for me. So I was a bit demotivated, but I then like started uh, like basically that was how I, uh, that is how I entered into CP um, overall and then I ch switched my language to C++ from Java because I guess C++ is a better language for competitive programming overall. So that's how I started my programming journey. Yeah, interesting. So first of all, you started with, uh, you know, uh, doing DSA in Java and then mm -hmm. eventually moved on to competitive programming, right? Yes. And, uh, you mentioned that you saw your friends doing it, so you kind of felt motivated. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and how is the overall culture, you know, at uh, Bitmesa? Like, how is the coding culture? No, the coding culture here is like pretty good, uh, especially regarding competitive programming because there are uh, like many competitive programmers in our batch, many candidate masters and masters too. So yeah, that is like that is something that motivated me a lot because there was always a you know, kind of, I would say peer, peer pressure or competition to, you know, do better than each other. Although that is not a good thing, to be honest. But that is something that motivates us, like, overall. Got it, got it. I think, like, overall, you know, have, being in a college where the coding culture is just amazing is, like, does play a very big role, right? Uh, in yes. my case, so, like, I am from AAAT Delhi, so uh, my college's coding culture is also just amazing. So I got introduced to competitive programming right from my very first year of college, right? Um, and I know for a fact that there are many colleges in India where people get to know about coding in their fourth year, right? And by that time, it's just too late to probably grab an internship offer, a full-time offer, or maybe even, you know, uh, like get started with programming properly, right? Yes. Although it is too late to start programming, but the earlier you start, the better it is for you, right? Okay. So uh, let me also ask you this uh, thing that, okay, uh, when you started with competitive programming, right? We all uh, face a lot of problems. Initially, we are not able to solve problems. We go on code forces, code chef. We feel absolutely stuck, right? So how was it for you when you were starting out, considering that you had already done a bit of DSA? Okay, so when I started solving problems on, uh, because I the only platform that I knew about for competitive programming was code chef. So I just struck up with some, I decided that from today, I'll practice some problems to do better in uh, future contests. So I just picked up some random problem on code chef and it was some really uh, because that was using concepts like DFS and all that. And I haven't even heard of them. So I was like, I, I wasn't able to do that. And I was pretty demotivated, uh, but still I was like, uh, then I, I was uh, only giving contests on code chef and practicing on different platforms, not uh, code chef because I wasn't, wasn't even able to solve a single problem. So there was no point of practicing there. So I pra started practicing on hacker rank a little bit. Then, then that was the point that I was introduced with code forces. And then I started giving contests on code forces a little bit. And then after that, uh, like 
uh, I like just somehow came to know that the correct way to practice is by increasing the difficulty of problems. So I started with 1100 difficulty and then 1200 and then kept moving on. Like that was the like the mainly the part where I was consistent in practicing daily. Like I did two to three problems daily uh, on, on daily basis. I was like admin that I have to do two to three problems daily. And that's how I kept practicing to reach specialist. Got it, got it. I think this is the biggest, most important thing in competitive programming. You have to be consistent. You have to continuously solve more and more problems, right? Uh, and you mentioned that you used to solve two to three problems every single day, right? So I also want to know that how much time were you dedicating when you were solving two to three problems? How much time mm. on a day were you giving? I guess I was giving about four to six hours daily. Sometimes because I was solving difficult problems, so it took time. So like four to five hours, uh, approx I was giving daily to competitive programming. All right, that's that's really impressive. Uh, giving four to five hours, uh, you know, on competitive programming every single day, that's a very, very difficult thing, right? Uh, and I can understand that, you know, you must be stuck at a lot of points, like solving a single problem, being stuck on it for almost two to three hours. That's really demotivating, first of all, and uh, really impressive that you were able to do it. So I also want to know from you that uh, since you mentioned that only uh, to solve two to three problems, you were taking four to six hours. So do you think there is a limit on the amount of time that you should spend on a problem or you should just spend a lot of time, as much time as you have on a single problem? I think it varies from like problem to problem because sometimes when we see a problem and like we don't have any clue about it. Uh, so that is something like um, thinking about, I guess, 20, 25 minutes. And then also if I'm not able to get to even a single approach, then I, on such problems, I used to give 30 minutes. And if I was like feeling that I'm close to approach and like, I'm just missing out something. So I used to give uh, around one hour to that approach and then implementation. So it depends on the problem because if I'm not able to, I have, I don't have any clue about that problem. Then I don't think so that wasting much more time on that problem is going to be productive. But if I'm close, then I will, would used to think about different approaches that I can solve and optimize this problem. Like that is how I um, usually solve problems. And were there instances where you had to completely quit a problem, like uh, not able to get any ideas, even the editorial doesn't seem, uh, you know, into yes. to completely quit it. Being honest, uh, like on my code forces profile, there are around 60 to 65 unsolved problems that I have submitted once, but I have not completed it till now. Okay. So uh, what do you think about this entire scenario of people getting obsessed with problems? Like I know for a fact, when I was into competitive pro uh, programming almost two to three years ago, I used to be so obsessed with a single problem that, okay, if I cannot uh, solve this problem, I am not a good competitive programmer. This is how I used to feel, right? So do you think we should get obsessed with problems or should we move on? Is it okay to move on to other problems? I think once in a while, if you get obsessed, that isn't going to hurt because some things like that teaches you uh, like a lot of concepts uh, because you think in three, three different, four different ways about a single problem. And that's how actually you approach when you see a new problem you try to fit something like how will this problem be solved uh, according to the concepts that you have learned earlier. So that helps in solving new problems, but I guess uh, giving like everything, like, you know, doing this daily and giving two to three hours on each problem, that is not productive at all because you need to eventually move on from a problem. So I guess uh, it should be a balance between this. Also, Ratul, you mentioned that, you know, uh, you used to solve thousand level problems, then you used to increase the difficulty to 1100, 1200 and so on. Right. So what really happens is that once we get comfortable in a particular rating range, like 1300 on code forces, when we try to move to a higher range, you know, it is very easy for us to say that, okay, for anybody, just go and solve harder problems. But I know for a fact that it is actually very challenging. How did you overcome this entire challenge of moving from a particular rating range to a higher rating range and still, uh, you know, feeling motivated uh, every single time you did it? Okay, so uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, got stuck on uh, the difficulty switch from 1300 to 1400 and then from 1500 to 1600. So uh, I tackled this uh, in this way, like, uh, first of all, I tried two to three problems. And then I, uh, if I wasn't able to do solve those problems, then uh, what I did is the, the older code for forces problems, because earlier the code forces problems used to be a bit easier than they are today. So I used to solve the same difficulty, but the older problems, because that is, that gives me an uh, eventual, like really gradual increase in difficulty. So I was able to do that. So what I did is I 
sorted the problems in terms of acceptance and i then for the same difficulty and, I, and then i started doing the problems from the highest acceptance because that problem in that difficulty range also that problem is a bit easier so i mm-hmm. did in that way and then uh, solving uh, then i skipped like 10 to 12 problems and then in, de- increase the acceptance so that's how i tackled this because uh, sometimes the newer problems are really difficult to do so yeah so uh, for the audience just to give you guys some context so when ratul mentioned that he used to pick up problems which had the highest acceptance so what he really meant was that you know when you go on code forces first of all you have a rating filter you can apply a filter of let's suppose picking up only 1300 rated problems and within the 1300 rated problems also you can apply a sorting function which sorts all the problems from uh, you know in a way that okay hi- highest number of uh, submissions whichever problem that has it comes first right so this is how he used to pick up problems and okay this is a very good strategy by the way because when you know you go from 1300 to 1400 to 1500 you get all sorts of random problems and you might get almost like the toughest problem in 1500 as the very first problem that you're solving so sorting by the uh, you know acceptance uh, number uh, does really help also you know uh, i want to know that uh, when you were a newbie like you know when you wanted to go from a newbie to a specialist uh, what were certain challenges that you faced that time and when you had to go from let's suppose specialist to expert i think going from newbie to specialist is like an entirely different ball game and going from specialist to expert is like an entirely different ball game so is there any difference that you felt in your own approach towards problems or your own approach towards this whole journey that you had so from newbie to expert i guess uh, from newbie to specialist i uh, just i was just solving problems gradually and i guess when you are able to solve the like a b problem uh, pretty fast then you are able to reach specialist uh, and for that crossing that expert barrier you need to solve the c problem uh, and so so what i usually used to do was for uh, till for reaching specialist i used to <clears throat> gradually solve problems uh, practice daily but uh, then i like for around i guess 1500 rating i was i had a block and i was wasn't able to increase my rating so i just i just uh, first of all learned concepts like dp and graph because dp is something that is uh, multiple times uh, a c problem so i learned dp i uh, i like practiced dp a lot and the uh, other thing that i did was i uh, like i increased the number of problems that i was practicing daily so uh, when like uh, before my like just before my summer internship uh, because summer interns uh, uh, like companies come to the college for summer intern in i guess august so uh, from january to i guess before the summer vacations i was solving four to five five to six problems daily and then uh, during my uh, during the summer vacation like i just completely went on because i i was like giving 12 hours to competitive programming daily and i was solving 10 to like around 10 problems uh, i was solving lead code hard problems and 3 cp pro- five lead, lead code hard problems 3 cp problems and i was distributing like that and i i was like doing i just increased my practicing a lot i increased the number of problems a lot uh, that is what i did to reach expert important that is actually very very impressive like you know spending so much time on cp i hardly see people doing it these days so that's actually very very impressive um, also you know ratul can you mention a bit about your overall interview process at medianet like uh, what were the number of rounds how did it even start and uh, just a bit about the overall process okay so uh, it was an ft plus 6 months opportunity at our campus only uh, and uh, <clears throat> um basically uh, there were total i guess four rounds uh, and the first one was the online uh, coding assessment that w- that contains three problems though all three were competitive programming based problems and uh, then uh, then after that the first round was a uh, fun- computer fundamentals and plus uh, dsa uh, like plus competitive programming round uh, so they asked a, a graph problem um, in that round and some uh, operating systems and uh, dbms related uh, uh, like theoretical problems and the second round was also uh, uh, like algorithms round only in, in which they asked me a dsu based problem and some again some os and dbms based so the third round was a managerial round and it were uh, it had it cont- cont- it contained some technical questions but uh, uh like uh, we had a in depth discussion about b trees uh, like uh, like b tree and b plus trees it was a half an hour discussion about that and and half an hour discussion about like observation plus uh, like observation plus programming problem so 
uh, two problems were discussed uh, during that round. And after that, uh, there was an HR round. And after that, I got that offer. Okay, interesting. Uh, so, you know, uh, what I can understand from this entire process is that uh, you were asked a lot of algorithms based problems, a lot of competitive programming problems, right? And it is also expected from media.net, like almost everybody knows that, okay, media.net is famous for asking these, you know, very difficult uh, CP based problems. Okay. So I also want to know this from you that, okay, this is a trend in the, in the entire industry that, uh, okay, you have to become a candidate master only then you are eligible for companies like media.net, uh, coordination and all of these companies. So considering that, you know, you went to something like expert, your highest was 1645. Uh, do you feel that these problems were so damn difficult that you had to be a candidate master only to solve them or was it still manageable? Mm, like, uh, no, I don't think so that they were like one problem was a bit difficult, but I had practiced problems up to like range of 1900 to 2000 difficulty. So I was able to do it. Uh, so I guess, uh, like I can say that you can do it. F uh, it is completely doable for an expert too. It's just, it just requires a amount of practice because there is no specific rating range that you have to reach, uh, to solve, uh, like particular, particular problems. But, uh, yeah, uh, those were pretty difficult problems, but an expert can do that too. Also, Ratul, what I know from your journey is that you joined TLE, uh, you know, in December, 2022, you joined the sixth batch of TLE eliminators. But uh, what I also know is that you are already an expert by then, right? So why did you join TLE and uh, like, what was the motivation behind uh, probably going for a complete competitive programming course? Okay, so uh, like uh, during my summer intern season when companies were coming for a summer internship, then yeah, like I was expert uh, at that time too. So I was pretty confident that I would really get a good offer. Um, but uh, like... Uh, then I really came across how the actual process of placements and internships is like, it's completely like it's for most of the companies. It's really random. Like you cannot even like, you cannot even know why, like you will not even know why didn't you get shortlisted. That is the main thing. Like you are not able to figure out why you didn't get shortlisted. So uh, like during that time, I like just figured out that there are some companies that have a fair shortlisting process. Like, uh, like I wouldn't say fair, but like they have their own criteria. So like companies like sprinkler, where they ask companies like sprinkler and media and like coordination, they asked, they asked, uh, like, uh, pretty difficult problems and they are not easily Google, Google able that, uh, because some, like most of the companies that they brought the problems there, they are Google able and everyone just Googles them and does them. So like there is no competition, like there is no separating factor that I did more problems, but, uh, uh companies like these there is a separating factor that you did more problems so you will definitely get an interview call because uh, during my summer interns also i was just uh, like i had just two opportunities to give interview one was for asthesium for which i which i was rejected and uh, like uh, then the second i got was for gp and i was selected in that so uh, after getting selected in uh, gp for summer intern i i was like pretty adamant that i need to get a better offer so uh, then I targeted these companies specifically because of their selection process. Uh, and I, I was confident that if I get, if I just get to uh, give an interview or uh, like, if I get an interview call, I would be able to clear, clear it. So, but that was the problem that I wasn't able to get interview calls. So then I joined TLE to like, uh, learn advanced concepts to like segment trees and like, uh, uh binary index trees and, and advanced DP problems to learn these concepts to majorly to clear the OAS of these companies and, and, and to help me in the interview process. So that's why I joined TLE eliminators to target these companies specifically. Okay, interesting. So I can tell you that, you know, I am able to completely relate with your journey. Uh, when I was like, you know, applying for internships, when I was applying for placements, my only thought was that, okay, I am a very good competitive programmer. If some company comes and asks very, very difficult problems, only I and some other people who are good in competitive coding will be able to clear it. Right. So for a lot of competitive programmers who are actually very good, uh, they actually end up targeting companies like HFTs because in HFTs, what happens is that the process is not at all random. They are going to ask you very, very difficult problems and even companies like sprinkler media.net and coordination. A great part about these companies is that uh, they're very, very favorable towards competitive programmers because they ask very difficult problems and almost nobody is able to solve them. Only people who have done a lot of uh, competitive coding are able to do them. 
so i think that was a very good thought that you put into it that okay you want to get a good offer what are your strengths uh, you're already an expert on code forces if you can double down on your strengths and maybe get an offer at a company which doesn't have a random shortlisting process that's that's actually a very good thought that you put into it so that's actually impre uh, impressive also ratul can you tell us which level of tle eliminators uh, you had joined uh, back then because i joined the level uh, 4 of tle eliminators to learn the harder topics that are taught in it okay okay and you were already an expert right so uh, what were certain things that you felt you learned new here like was there anything that you learned new or just you solved harder problems at tle okay so i was like uh, uh, like the topics taught uh, on level 4 i was comfortable with dp i guess uh, not that but i was uh, i had a good grip on it and i was comfortable with segment trees but uh, uh, after joining tle i was like uh, introduced with various variations of dp like uh, like dp on uh, dp on dags and then uh, like dp on trees tree rerouting i was uh, completely unaware of these topics and then uh then i was like <clears throat> for segment trees also like i wasn't uh, like uh, like the particular types of problem in which you merge two nodes and, and those types of problems i was wasn't uh, like uh, familiar with them and then i learned about fenwick trees and then uh, also i learned about sparse tables so these were the topics i uh, majorly learned that were new in uh, tle 4 interesting i think rerouting dp and uh, like dp on trees overall concept is like very very important for online assessments i see a lot of companies asking problems on these in fact in my coordination interview also i was uh, asked a problem on uh, dp on trees so yeah i think that is something which a lot of people actually skip uh, a lot of people don't even know about that concept of rerouting dp okay so rahul now we know that okay you learned so many concepts you joined tle with a lot of motivation you eventually ended up learning these concepts and eventually ended up becoming a better problem solver but you know it doesn't happen with every single person who joins tle right i cannot like as a founder also i cannot say that if 500 people join tle eliminators all 500 of them are going to be amazing at problem solving after this right there is a factor of motivation which plays out there is also a factor of dedication like how dedicated are you towards actually completing the course right so uh, can you give us uh, or can you give uh, certain tips for the current students at tle eliminators that okay these are the things that you should not do and these are the things that you should do in order to get the best out of the entire three months boot camp that you are a part of okay so the first uh, tip would be that uh, attend the classes live like i know it's not always possible but you like that is really helpful because that keeps you on date with uh, those thing but, but once you delay it then it just keeps on getting delayed uh, that is one thing and the other thing is that when you like when we used to get the daily practice problems like like i used to do them uh, like daily it was like some days that i used to miss them and then i used to do them on saturdays sundays but uh, like the major tip is that doing the practice problems daily and uh, understanding the concepts behind each and every practice problem like uh, like if i am not able to solve it then i have to like see the like uh, solution or the uh, discussion the daily discussion that you uh, that happened at tle so these are the two major things that i would say the main thing is that i solved each and every problem like uh, each and every practice problem till the end i was uh, like uh, connected with that and i was solving the practice problems daily so that is i guess the major difference because most of the people leave the course like they stop practicing problem mm -hmm. maybe because they are like not able to do them or like uh, getting demotivated so that is like overcoming demotivation if you are not able to do them that is an important thing i guess so you mentioned about uh, solving problems daily right not a lot of people do that uh, even though we have this entire concept of daily practice problems we tell them that okay these are the problems that you have to do today people end up just piling up all the work and then they try to do it at the end so again that doesn't work out because eventually when you're rushing with problems you are not going to get the maximum out of every single problem right and you also mentioned about attending the classes live right uh, i think eventually people just end up relying on the recordings almost at the end of our third month of the course there are so many people who are just watching the recordings and they are not attending it live right so do you feel there is some difference between like live classes and recorded classes like why should people attend live classes in the first place i guess the main difference is that uh, like you feel like you are at par with like it's majorly that you feel that you are at par and there is nothing pending so you can make you can practice on the uh, daily practice problem because if you delay that uh, the live class then 
then you would eventually delay the practice problems and so it just keeps on piling up that is the major thing uh, in attending the classes live right that was really really insightful ratul uh, i am pretty sure so many people who are currently enrolled in tle eliminators they would have gotten some insights right and they would be much more motivated now to solve all of those practice problems every single day and attend the classes live so thank you so much for uh, taking out time and i really wish you the very best uh, for your internship and also for your full time uh, at media.net so do you have any last tips or any last words that you want to end this podcast with i guess for the competitive programmers that are oncoming please stay consistent uh, that's the most important thing the rest all of it will fall in place uh, like that's the main advice from my side and thank you priyans thank you for the opportunity